let's see how this will work. Um, good morning, everybody. Kurmete Katsushilar, Soyle Ushiler, Sudenter, Jana Bizden Konachtar, Sizderde, Jetenshe Eurasialik Jogari Belim, Kosh Bachelari Forumunda Karsiaruga Kwanishtamen. Also, Bezden Isharano Ashim Ushin, Soz Gezagin, Kazakhstan, Respublika Senen, Memleketik, Katshe, Gulshara, Naushal Kazana, Beruge, Ruksat, Etinis there. Kair Lukun, Kormete Forum Wakat Sushlar, Kormete Konachtar, Kormete Studentier, Usa Forum Jumsna, Ulkin Satlik Tlimen. Уважаемые участники форума, уважаемые гости, рада вас приветствовать на седьмом Евразийском форуме лидеров высшего образования, организованного Назарбаев университетом. Символично, что это мероприятие проводится в год 20-летнего юбилея Астаны, символа Казахстана. Одним из основных приоритетов государственной политики нашей страны является всестороннее развитие системы образования. Президент Казахстана Нурсултан Назарбаев, обращаясь к молодежи, подчеркнул, «Я всегда старался создать все необходимое условие для вашего обучения и роста. Создал университет мирового уровня, интеллектуальные школы, учредил программу Булаша». Назарбаев университет является важным национальным проектом. За 8 лет своей деятельности он завоевал особое признание в глобальном университетском сообществе. Как вы знаете, с прошлого года ВУЗ является полноправным учредителем Альянса университетов Азии. Он встал в один ряд 14 ведущими университетами Азии из Китая, Японии, Республики Корея, Сингапура и других государств. Нас радует, что у казахстанской молодежи есть возможность получать глубокие знания в университете мирового уровня в своей стране. Сегодня Астана, благодаря Назарбаев университету, превращается в одного из лидеров знаний и фундаментальной науки Евразии. Уважаемые дамы и господа, за 26 лет независимости наша страна провела две модернизации, вошла в число 50 развитых экономик мира. Сегодня мы реализуем стратегию 2050, направленную на вхождение в тридцатку наиболее развитых стран. Для этого принят план нации. В прошлом году запущена третья модернизация, главная цель которой – создание новой модели экономики, политическое реформирование и обновление общественного сознания. Сердцевиной этих процессов является программа «Рухани Жангру». На недавно прошедшем Астанинском экономическом форуме Глава государства отметил пять главных мегатрендов глобальных изменений – цифровизацию, переход чистой энергетики, рост населения планеты, урбанизацию и трансформацию рынка труда. Послание этого года «Новые возможности развития в условиях четвертой промышленной революции» Одной из задач определено развитие человеческого капитала, предусматривающее создание собственной передовой системы образования. Для этого нам нужно адаптировать сферу образования под потребности новой инновационной индустриализации, нацеленной на переход от практики передачи знаний к формированию навыков креативного мышления, умения находить нужную информацию и верно принять ее. Скорость научно-технического прогресса требует от современного человека готовности сменить несколько профессий, период трудовой деятельности, исследовать принципу образования в течение всей жизни. Сегодня наиболее актуализирована взаимосвязь всех уровней образования. Мы создали парадигму преемственности среднего и высшего образования на примере Назарбаев интеллектуальных школ и Назарбаев университета. 
К достижению этой модели стремятся все организации образования страны. Идет полная трансляция опыта Назарбаев школы и Назарбаев университета. Важно внедрять инновации в учебный процесс. Для этого необходимо создавать не только инфраструктурные возможности, но и соответствующую атмосферу, дух и настрой. В таких реалиях роль университета в подготовке востребованных кадров постоянно возрастает. В этом контексте форум лидеров высшего образования является эффективной платформой для решения значимых проблем современности. Высшие учебные заведения должны готовить специалистов нового формата, подготовленных по передовым программам обучения, чтобы в дальнейшем они были конкурентоспособны на рынке труда. В этом плане Назарбаев университет является флагманом системы высшего образования. С момента его создания из стен вуза выпущено около 2000 специалистов. Университет готовит кадры Порядки не только для Казахстана, но и для многих развитых стран мы направляем кадры. Это, к примеру, биохимическая и ядерная инженерия, робототехника, механотроника. Здесь работают лучшие преподаватели со всего мира. ВУЗ оснащен самыми, самыми современными материально-техническими средствами и лабораториями. Мы гордимся, что Назарбаев университет состоялся как глобальный научно-образовательный центр. Показателем успешной работы является высокий спрос на его выпускников с крупнейших компаниях страны, ведущих научных институтов, медицинских учреждениях и на госслужбе. В эти, дни, и, в эти дни и другие вопросы будут всесторонне обсуждаться в стенах данного университета. Надеюсь, что в будущем наш форум станет одним из ведущих саммитов мира. Уверена, что по итогам проведения нашей диалоговой площадки будут выработаны конструктивные предложения, обмен опытом и, конечно же, гости будут наслаждаться пребыванием в нашей стране в столице нашей Родины, в Астане. Желаю всем плодотворной работы и успехов. Thank you, Madam Secretary. Um, you may have all listened, I'm sure, very carefully to the thoughtful remarks. And I want to thank Madam Secretary also for not only uh, sharing the information about Nazarbayev University to the members or the participants of the conference, but also setting the bar very high for us. Thank you. I think uh, the more ambitious goals we are setting, I think the better for our university. Um, dear guests, I will keep my opening remarks very short. We will have the substantive sessions coming up immediately after, and I will do a little presentation there, or a little bit more going into what goes on in my mind uh, right now. Um, but I want to just add a few words to what Madam Secretary has already exposed. She talked about the changes you know that we discussed the global challenges at the Astana Economic Forum recently but also the way that President uh, Nazarbayev has framed Kazakhstan's response to these global megatrends um, and we all learned through those sessions that university education and research will be impacted and through three different vectors One obviously is through the ever-changing requirements of the future job market. We already heard a lot about it and how universities have to adapt. Um, the second obviously also comes from the uh, interface of technology and the impact of technology on research and the research endeavor. Uh, and I'm always sort of uh, reminded of one of the speakers at the Economic Forum, uh, Professor McKeefe from, from MIT, who uh, gave a vivid example of how he went and uh, visited uh, 
uh, DNA gene coding facility or company in California. And uh, he basically discussed with them how they did progress in their research. And with the introduction, they said that over the 10 years or so, they had improved or made progress in terms of scientific discovery of about 15% or so, over, over 10, 15 years. Then over the last two, three years, they introduced more artificial intelligence-based, big data-based approaches. And within two, three years, they actually progressed another 8%. So what took them you know, 10 years, in two years, they already had half again of this much. But then, even more striking, they had come up with 15 pathways for new uh, discoveries uh, related to gene coding, uh, gene splicing, and various techniques. And then they discussed those with their scientists. And the scientists said, well, out of the 15, three, yeah, we would have thought about it anyway. Another three, they said, hmm, yeah, it's a stretch, but okay, why not? Another three, they said, wow, we didn't think about it. And another six said, they said, come on, get out of it. I mean, meaning it's totally out of their realm of imagination. And it's a vivid example of how uh, technology is really going to shape the directions of of uh, you know research as well, and of course the third dimension is coming from technology related to technologies is how it will impact on the our core business of instructions education itself, and I think this is something for all of us to consider, be it the introduction of virtual reality, augmented reality tools. Um, we know that technology already is with us when we talk about uh, you know, the uh, massive open courses, MOOCs, and so on. And of course, here in Kazakhstan, we also need to collectively think about how we can best exchange the best experience um, among our universities so that the best courses, the most instructive courses, can be shared by the maximum number of, of uh, students. Um, but this also will put enormous pressure on the way courses are taught and the way that pedagogy is going to happen in the future. So in, in many ways, we already know that there are a lot of pressures. Hopefully, collectively, we are, will be able to discuss these uh, changes that are imminent. And uh, over the next day and a half, I do encourage you all to be active participants. Please do not be passive. Uh, and passive listeners, but I do hope that collectively, together, we will be able to find and identify, uh, identify our pathway forwards. So thank you very much, and if you allow us, we will just break for a few minutes so that I can escort um, Madam Secretary out. And one more time, thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule. I know that you're very busy. You already have another appointment, so thank you very much. And I'll be back in a few minutes. Thank you. Құрметті қонақтар, ә, бос орындарға отыруыңызды сұраймыз. Кішкене жылжып, ә, бір екі минутта бастаймыз. Бос орындарға адамдарды, орын жоқ адамдарға ә, жіберуіңізді өтінеміз. Егер ортасында болса, кішкене ортаға қарай жылжып, орын беруіңізді өтінеміз. Ә, уважаймай коллеги, просим вас ә, занять свободные места. Пожалуйста, не держите резерв. Дайте, пожалуйста, людям, которые уже пришли, возможность ә, занять места. Пожалуйста, не держите резерв. Проходите, занимайте места. Сейчас в течение пару минут мы начнем. Хорошо, сейчас. А, наушники для перевода вы можете получить у нас а, в 
на стойке регистрации, пожалуйста, оставьте удостоверение личность, либо документ любой а, в качестве залога. Коллеги, пожалуйста, занимайте места, проходите с лестницы, кто там с краев, занимайте поближе. Вот здесь есть места, еще вижу, в центре места. Пожалуйста, те, у кого рядом есть место, пожалуйста, позовите человека, который сидит на лестнице. У нас очень полный зал получился. Вот здесь два места, пожалуйста, проходите. Третий ряд, два места. Два места, третий ряд. Айгуля, Аселя. Айгуля, Аселя, два места вот здесь в третьем ряду есть. Good morning, can you hear me? All right. So uh, welcome to uh, this year's edition of our Eurasian Higher Leaders uh, Education Leaders Forum. Um, you know, every year we are trying to uh, build what we think might be a little bit more of an attractive mousetrap. I mean, mousetrap and attractive is a little bit of an oxymoron, but um, we try to find ways on how to, to uh, shape our forum to be more interactive and as much as possible eliminate barriers between the presenters and you, the audience, and this in order to facilitate interaction. Um, I will just, for this opening session, present you uh, just uh, to introduce the subject on uh, why we are talking about this disruptive technologies. I told you I'm going to share with you a little bit more what goes on in my head. Um, and, uh, but before I get to that, some, I was asked to remind you of some general information. You all have registered. Uh, I guess almost everybody has a smartphone these days. So you all have registered. You have used this application called Whova. And in it, you find all the information um, that you need with respect to the conference, the sessions, the speakers. But there's also a facility uh, which allows you to try to say, I'm interested in meeting somebody who is just uh, close the university, for instance, rather than building. You know, I don't know if, whether anybody has closed the university, but anyway, it could be a case. So uh, you can try to post your, 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 your wishes on the SFUVA site and try to see whether anybody from the audience actually has that experience or can offer uh, related skills. Then you can meet up and our upper or lower atrium has coffee and uh, facilities and you know, seating areas where you can sit down and discuss your specific topic. So please uh, do make use of this facility because our conference is all about meeting and building networks and exchanging information. While we hope that our formal sessions are attractive enough to keep your attention, it is almost as important that you also have an opportunity to talk to each other. Um, second, while we go about all our presentations, uh, again, uh, I'm sure our, our colleagues have already informed you and you may have found some flyers on your, on your desk, uh, on your seats. Um, there is something called Pigeon. Whole. It's a software. There is a code. You have to put in the code, which is eHealth in caps. And you can use this facility to ask questions 
in any language that you would like, uh, provided that the software can actually accommodate it. Wali Khan, how many languages does it accommodate? Do we know? Hmm. At least we know that one of our speakers has, a, has already developed an application where it seamlessly will translate uh, from any language into another one. So we will, may have to go back to, to that apps in the future. Um, so you can therefore, while the presentations go on, ask questions, make your comments, and please also, you can either put your name on it or you can stay anonymous. And please vote also on these comments that you see maybe from others, things that you like or maybe not like, because those questions that they get the highest votes probably will bubble up to the top of the list. Okay? Now, we will not show the questions while the, while the presentations are going on, because it gets very disrupt, uh, disruptive behind. Even though we talk about disruption, I think we want the the presentations to be the focus. Okay? Um, I will call up each of our three first speakers uh, in sequence up to the stage. Each one of them will have about 15, 17 minutes. And um, then afterwards, they first go back to their seats. But when after once all the presentations are finished, I will invite them here on stage, and we're going to have a nice uh, discussion and conversation. Okay? Now, just uh, to set the stage, um, and why we decided to uh, choose this theme. So, as you see here, Nazarbayev University, uh, Madam Secretary referred to it just recently, celebrated its fourth commencement, fourth graduation ceremony. Eight years, we are now eight years old, st certainly still much younger than uh, other universities. Now let's see whether it works. Um, and here we share with you just simply some of the building blocks. Probably all of you who are from, from uh, here in Kazakhstan, but also in the region, have heard about it. <clears throat> we are very lucky we have a special legal framework, Nazarbayev University Law. Importantly, academic freedom, institutional autonomy is legally enshrined. Our, du uh, our duty, therefore, is to share our experience, the good, the bad, and the ugly, with our colleagues from the rest of the university system, and also to fight with the authorities so that our privileges become the privileges of every university. So academic freedom, institutional autonomy, more <coughs> resources, and hopefully also building endowment funds and so on. Um, the hallmark of our university is everything is merit-based, uh, so all the students have to come in through competition. There is no way around it, and they also have to maintain academic standards uh, to move up. And of course, no cheating, no plagiarism there as well. So academic integrity and transparency, rules based is very important. And uh, further, we try to integrate teaching and, and research. Uh, our language of instruction and research is, is English. Of course, we also do uh, teach Kazakh language here. Otherwise, we could not function either. We have developed uh, institutionally thanks to a series of institutional partnerships, strategic partnerships. So we also recently just had a partnership meeting. And we very much pride ourselves of having uh, developed and adopted a number of key and new values of which academic integrity certainly are, uh, uh, is a core element, but also the whole question of ethics, of personal ethics, um, of being, uh, because we are, like all universities, we are being asked to, to educate and nurture future leaders, and therefore the type of leaders that we want to see is very important. Of course, we want them to be inclusive, considerate uh, throughout. Um, and those are then translated into our graduate attributes. We are now about 4,300 students. We just had our fourth graduation cohort. I think we do pretty well. Our students do pretty well in student competitions. And indeed, uh, graduates are our best ambassadors. 
because now they start to populate. 2,600 graduates are now starting to spread their wings across the world. Um, we are also blessed, you know, one of the speakers who will, whom I shall introduce came up with this famous uh, uh, sort of summary of what makes, what do you need for world-class university. You need talent, 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 you need resources and good governance. And in our case, we have talented students, we have talented faculty, it's a mini United Nations of over 55 countries. Uh, everybody has to, all professors have to have Western style PhDs and, you know, our, our um, promise uh, with the government was in exchange for giving us obviously all these privileges and the resources that we will deliver an outstanding educational product. So we believe that our, our instructions courses are as good as those that you, our uh, students would get in the Boloshak uh, chosen universities. Um, now, however, what's next? And this is where this topic starts to come up. Uh, we know that our world is ev even more than before characterized by what we call the VUCA world, a world that is ever more volatile, ever more <coughs> sort of unpredictable, we only have to look at uh, what is happening uh, across the Atlantic Ocean. It would have been certainly unpredictable in many ways. Um, ever, a world ever more complex and ever more ambiguous where uh, clear lines increasingly get, get uh, you know, fuzzier. Uh, in such a world, our mandates are very clear. Um, and if we are a prototype for Kazakhstan universities, this is what you all also have to grapple with. And that is, we will now enter the world of advanced research, innovation, entrepreneurship, uh, as a way also to, to, to foster the spirit of innovation, <coughs> diversification, help in the diversification of the economy. And of course, internationalization of the student body is a big task. Um, it, Kazakhstan is not isolated from the world. Kazakhstan, Mr. President says, Kazakhstan has to join the top 30 nations by 2050. And that means our students need to be measured also and our product needs to be measured internationally. Right now, it is a global competition. Regardless of boundaries of countries, everybody's chasing after the best talent that they can get. So internationalization of the student body is very important and for that we also have joined some of the new uh, university alliances such as the Asian Universities Alliance and, and the likes. Um, now we have key challenges uh, and uh, I see that uh, it was a little bit different but I think I can live with this uh, big challenges ahead. These are some of the things that are, uh, we are de debating <coughs> internally as to how to make sure that we will be able to hold our own and move in this uh, world of advanced research and innovation while coping with the VUCA world. And among all these things, important is <coughs> the point about sta staying ready for change, the one in the bottom. That is what we really want to talk about in an ever-changing world, how do we make sure that we are not going to fall into complacency? How are we going to make sure that we constantly have our radar scan up and are able to scan all the developments around us and anticipate even developments at, at the minimum adjust and if, they are, uh, if there are any adverse developments to mitigate those things. Um, Madam Secretary uh, had already talked about what more recently President Nazarbayev mentioned or talked about the five global uh, mega trends at the, at the Astana Economic Forum and the five uh, responses in particular, I mean the Kazakhstan's responses to those five mega trends uh, from digital Kazakhstan to the post-expo commitment to green uh, energy, clean energy and green technologies 
uh, to building modern, smart, resilient cities such as Astana uh, ideas um, and productive cities because this is where the productivity growth occurs. Demographics uh, in a world in 2050 where we have 3 billion more people, you know, obviously food production, increasing food, but also the means of increasing food production via uh, a sustainable environment is obviously important. And the labor market transformation that he mentioned, and as a response, it was basically to revamp and modernize the education system here in Kazakhstan and in particular the higher education system, uh, which would be focusing on critical uh, thinking. And as we already heard from the speech of, of the state secretary, uh, the ability in this world where we are all uh, overwhelmed with information, with digital information, binary information, how do we best find a way to actually find the right information at the right time and also apply it correctly? Um, so, uh, also, just last week, uh, we had our fourth commencement graduation ceremony, and President Nazarbayev kindly found time in his busy schedule and joined us. And, of course, whenever he comes, which is a great honor, he also gives us tasks. And his three tasks to us was, indeed, he reminded us that uh, we are only one-third along the way because, indeed, we have to become a research and innovation powerhouse. Um, and he also wants us to indeed to become this center, global center for bright minds internationally. And he also reminded us that you can't do this without really uh, mastering, introducing and mastering technology in a smart manner. Okay? So it is also our topic of disruptive technologies firmly in the mind uh, on the agenda of President Nazarbayev when he talks about education. So another reason why we talk about this su topic today. Now, don't pay too much attention to all these details. Uh, this is simply a list that came out. We just also had our strategic partners meeting. And we, it was a series of brainstorming sessions. And in the end, they basically told us all these things, you know, you have to consider, you know. So my mind is definitely full, and I'm not trying to understand where I, we should be going, no? okay? Um, and you have contradictory think statements, you know? Some people think that uh, fourth industrial revolution and digitalization will change everything, including universities. And others think, uh, well, after all, it doesn't really change that much because the human mind doesn't change that quickly, so. Um, you tell me, and you can add to this list, we will distribute this list, and uh, so we shall see. So this is, <laughs> okay, this is really uh, where I am. I'm thinking, I'm not so sure which direction to go. And that is why I call upon all of you to help us think through, okay? And in particular, the speakers are all very experienced are very innovative in their thinking, and we shall try to uh, absorb their wise words and provocative, interesting contributions so that my mind can move forward. So please help me, all right? So this is my introduction, uh, and now let uh, me start to call on the speakers. The first speaker is uh, Dr. Uh, Salmi, Jamil Salmi, he's an old friend of mine. It's not because he's a friend that we call him, but he's generally considered as one of the most astute and uh, most well-known, experienced uh, tertiary education expert specialist globally. He used to be the tertiary education, higher education guru at the World Bank. Then he decided that he had enough of the World Bank and decided to move on and, and uh, uh, advise governments and universities throughout the world. He's, uh, he's been uh, busily also producing and editing and writing books, talking about how to create world-class universities, how to create 
world-class research universities. He's also taken up some case studies of fast-developing research universities and so on. And more recently, has really been talking, studying, and doing research into the uh, interaction of technology, higher education, and uh, research. So, Jamil, the floor is yours. You have 15 to 20 minutes. And I tell everybody you can stand on your head, you can deliver your message as you like, and you have your microphone on. Okay. Thank you very much. It's a great honor to be invited back. I remember this day of winter about 11 years ago, 10 years ago, where there was a blizzard. And we came straight from the airport to here, and I saw the first attempts at building this institution. And when each time I come back, I am amazed by progress. And <laughs> my last visit was three years ago, and again, I couldn't recognize most of the facilities. It's so <laughs> impressive. And I know we are, I have been invited to talk at an education leadership forum, but at the risk of disappointing President Katsui and all of you, I think it's much more interesting to talk about health than education, because health has changed so much. When I was a child, this is how a doctor's office would look. But today, if we go to a hospital, if we think about how the medical science has evolved. It's a totally different world. Whereas in education, I'm not sure that we see so much change. This was when I grew up, and this is today. <laughs> so we, we must hope that education is going to really be disrupted and transform itself. But I don't know what's going to happen. So I thought that I needed some help to tell you about the future of tertiary education. I just came from Hong Kong, so I, I went to Kowloon and I met this charming lady who kindly offered to tell me my future. And I thanked her, I said, look, my future is pretty much behind me. What is really, I'm looking forward is the future of tertiary education. So I took some notes and this is what she told me. In the future, going to university will be compulsory for all young people in any country. To recruit your new students, you will not look at your, their grades, but you will go to their Facebook history. And in fact, if the students have too good grades, you will not take them because you don't want nerds among your students. New students will get a free Kindle or an iPad with all the textbooks for their studies. Or if it's in engineering, they will get a toolbox. If they need financial assistance, they will participate in an online auction on eBay to get their scholarship or their student loan. And to pay their tuition fees, they might use frequent flyer miles or Bitcoin. In the future, elite universities will have no more than 15 students. And mass universities will have 1.5 million students all over the world. In the future, your students will be allowed to take open internet access exams. And because of all the changes that we're talking about, the validity of the degree will be only five years, which is bad news for the academics because every three years we'll have to re redo the, your curriculum, but not to worry because the average duration of a class in the future will be only 10 minutes. And most of them will be online anyway. In the future, you'll be it'll be much cheaper to, buy, to build a new university because you will have all iLabs and e-libraries and digital textbooks, flexbooks that can be updated every week. In fact, you will not give your students a digital a paper degree. It will be a digital degree um, based using um, uh, blockchain technology. In the future, boards of universities will have, uh, in their majority, young people 16 to 18 because they know more about the future than our generation. 
if your graduates do not find a proper job within six months of leaving the university, you will have to reimburse them the cost of their studies. Bad news for public universities because in the future you won't get more than 10% of your budget from governments. But you'll be so effective in, uh, get in fundraising that in the, in the middle of the academic year you will tell these philanthropists out there, that's enough for this year. Please come next year with your donations. Good news for university presidents because the annual salary will be more than $1 million a year. But, but, watch out, it will go up or down with the ranking of the university. <laughs> Similarly, professors' salary will be determined by the evaluation of their students. And the best professors might earn more than the prime minister in their country. In the future, in countries where English is not the native language, Parents will have small surgery performed on their children to cut the little skin that ties the tongue to your mouth to improve their English language pronunciation. <laughs> Obviously, my parents forgot to do that to me. <laughs> and lastly, if some of you still believe that the MBA is a good degree, forget about it, I'm sorry. <laughs> because in the future, it will all be about the MFA, the Master of Fine Arts because it will be all about creativity and design. Now, you may think that I'm telling you about a world of science fiction. I assure you that each of the examples that I just mentioned is a real-life case that I observed as I traveled around the world, symbolizing what I believe is the revolution that tertiary education is going through. And the question today is, are your universities ready? And certainly, as we, we were told by the secretary and the president, it's not business as usual anymore. And so in my short presentation, I want to run by you a few what-if questions that show how disruptive all these changes are going to be or are already for university. And the first question perhaps we have to ask is about economic growth and development. What if natural resources were not important anymore? The Prime Minister of Norway, Erna Sonberg, in one of her first speeches recently, astonished her fellow citizens by telling them, you know, we must forget about oil and gas. Knowledge is the oil of the future. And what if it were and, and it's not, no, no, the Nordic countries are not the only countries making this observation. Increasingly, countries are putting knowledge at the heart of their economic growth strategies. The Nordic countries, the EU, and the so-called Asian tigers or dragons, whichever animal you prefer to refer to. Here is one example. A small fisherman village in 1965. I'm sure some of you may have recognized Singapore, 500. GDP per capita, $500 at that time. And look at Singapore today. And in fact, we could do the same with a picture of Astana 20 years ago and a picture of Astana today. $60,000 per capita GDP, a smart city, livable. But they have no resources. When they started, they had to import. It's a small island. They had to import everything from portable water, food, energy, etc. And yet, they've achieved it. And just to give you an example of how universities have contributed. National University of Singapore. A friend of mine used to be the dean of engineering, and he tells me this true story. Ten years back, he, he observed, it's true, we don't have natural resources, but we do. We have the sun. And yet, we're not doing anything. So why don't we start a research institute in solar energy? So he asked his professors, who are the top leaders, experts in this field? And, they mentioned to him Professor Joachim Luther from Germany. So he flies to Germany, meets with the professor uh, to tell him about how great Singapore is. But Professor Luther is not very interested, said, thank you very much for the visit. I'm very busy. I'm, you know, I'm very happy in Germany. The president has just appointed me to chair a commission on the future of renewable energy in, uh, in Germany. So thank you for the visit. Bye bye. 
But uh, the dean, who he was a bit obstinate, uh, takes out from his pocket two business class tickets. He said, Professor, this is for you and your wife. Why don't you come to Singapore for a few days of vacation? And now I'm going to show you the picture of the inauguration of the new Solar Energy Research Institute in Singapore. On the left, you have the president of the country, former president of the Science Academy. And on the right, you have the first director of that institute. Can anyone guess the name of that director? <laughs> Professor Joachim Luther. And with him, he brought hundreds of thousands of research grant money. And as a result, a big Norwegian company invested $3.5 billion to establish uh, energy uh, products, um, solar energy, solar cells, etc., factories in Singapore. And by the way, this company has been so successful that it's just been bought up by a Chinese firm. What if it's not only about economic development? As you know, in 2015, the, the UN adopted the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. And I asked myself, how do tertiary education institutions contribute? And I believe they do that in four ways. First, by preparing the skilled and competent professionals that we need. Second, knowledge ad generation, adaptation, and dissemination. Third, institutional development and capacity building. And last but not least, values and citizenship skills. I was very interested to hear this morning the importance for Nazarbayev University of these dimensions. It so happened that because my wife is Colombian, I live in Bogota, Colombia, and as you know, it's a country that has had difficulties, and recently a very interesting ranking was prepared by a think tank, it's so called the Corruption Ranking. What they did, they took all the top businessmen, politicians, etc., who have been jailed recently because of corruption and other uh, crimes, and they looked at their final degree, which universities did they graduate from. And on the right, I put also what I call the excellence ranking that the Ministry of Higher Education designed. So we have the corruption ranking on the left and the academic ranking on the right. And sadly, you can see that some of the best universities in the country, this is the top university, it's a private university, this is the top public university, another private university, they are very good, but they're also very good at producing corrupts people. So we should not forget this element of value. And if we try to match all the 17 sustainable development goals with the functions that universities perform, you can see from the excess that what universities can contribute is so, so important. Now, what if we don't know about the jobs that we're preparing our graduates for? Because the world is changing because of these little guys, because of artificial intelligence, intelligent machines. Not only do we see many jobs disappearing, we see lots of new jobs. Here is just an example of a few jobs that didn't exist 10 years ago, from app developer to big data analyst, smart city, smart building, architect, etc. Driver, less car engineer, this is not science fiction. If you go to Singapore, most likely the taxi you hail will be a driverless taxi. So how can we prepare our graduates if we don't know what kind of jobs? And also, we have to accept that all jobs will be transformed very rapidly. What if the main functions are not to prepare professionals in terms of the professional content, but in terms of what is called the 21st century skills. Here, how students approach complex challenges and character qualities. So the generic complex capacity like information analysis, critical thinking and problem solving, global contextual analysis. You are not preparing student graduates here only for Astana or Kazakhstan or Central Asia. You're preparing global professionals and citizens. Teamwork and collaboration, communication, creativity. What if it's not only about science and technology? You know, all countries have these strategies to put forth STEM, but I would rather think about STEAM, 
the A of arts and humanities, because you want socially responsible professionals in all the various fields. And now I will indulge, since I have a captive audience for one minute, talking about the youngest, my youngest son, Karim, whom you can see on the right. He's been such a headache because he was a university dropout. So can you imagine you work all your life promoting higher education and your own son betrays you by <laughs> dropping out? And yet, he's not a failure. Because after dropping out, he asked me for $200 to go and register his company. And he started going to your houses to repair your computers or to retrieve your data if you, your hard disk uh, goes bust. But he didn't have any training in there. So when he started at age 19, I was very worried that he would got into trouble. And, but yet he became very successful. And one day I asked him, and his response, something, and his response just changed my mindset. I asked him, Karim, are you afraid that you go to a client and you won't know how to solve their problem? And he looked back, looked at me and said, but dad, how else do you want me to learn? So I believe that he and many other successful entrepreneurs have these important character qualities. Curiosity and motivation, initiative, entrepreneurial thinking, persistence. They fail, they learn from their failures, they get up and they try again, they fail again, and then they become successful. Adaptability in a rapidly changing world, leadership, and last but not least, coming again to this ethical awareness and reasoning about our social environment, about the uh, uh, cultural and the environment altogether. What if our future students are different species from what we are? My grandson, when he was a year and a half, started using an iPad in ways that I could never imagine were possible. We cannot teach them in the way we were taught. That doesn't work. So we need a totally new education approach, which is active, not passive, as she was saying, interactive and experiential. So I visit universities, and in fifth year of medicine, that's when they start seeing a patient. In fifth year of engineering, that's the first time they build something. That doesn't make sense. So we need curricular innovations to make learning experiential, multidisciplinary, because no important problem in our life today can be solved by just one discipline. Competency-based learning is not about how many hours or days or years we are studying. It's what are we capable of achieving. And it has, the curriculum has to be international because of global. Innovative pedagogical approaches, peer learning, project and design-based learning, simulations, serious games. Our kids spend hours playing these stupid video games, and yet they are so motivated. Why can't we make education as exciting as these video games? Self-learning using uh, artificial intelligence-based software. These are just a few examples. Uh, isn't that innovative? Everybody has a laptop. Isn't that great? No. You know, just type whatever I say without thinking. It is innovative only if the students are in the driver's seat in terms of active, interactive, and experiential learning. And we cannot innovate in our curriculum, in our pedagogy, and then have the same old exams. Uh, assessment has to be aligned as well. There is a great YouTube video from Eric Mazur from Harvard who developed uh, peer learning. And it's called Assessment, the Killer of Learning. Um, and more, more and more these exams don't, say, don't mean anything. There is a very successful firm in India called Aspiring Minds because uh, firms don't trust the degrees that universities give to their students. So these are competency-based tests that employers rely on to hire their uh, future graduates. 1.5 million students take these tests or graduates every year. And lastly, and this is a slide I showed already once uh, here, but I want to show it again. If what if we are preparing for lifelong learning? What if uh, we need to renew our knowledge constantly? So we cannot go on having the traditional shape, pyramid-like shape of a university, where most students are high school graduates and postgraduate students. No, we need to prepare for continuing education, 
so the traditional students, I believe, in the future will be just a minority. It's all about continuing education, career change studies, because graduates will have to have different jobs, not the same job in different companies, different jobs entirely. And we will be learning on campus and online in a hybrid mode. And lastly, now that we live in a post-truth world, what if the truth still was important? What if we don't want fake news? What if we don't want alternate facts? Uh, with a friend of mine and colleague, Pierre de Marais, former president of University, Free University of Brussels, last November at Jiaotong University, we declared, proclaimed these Shanghai principles, which I believe all world-class universities, such as Nazarbayev University, or aspiring to be world-class, should follow. Five principles, ethics, strong emphasis on these dimensions, objectivity, promoting critical thinking and fact-finding, inclusiveness, being an elite university doesn't mean that you are exclusive, and that Arizona State University has really shown the past in that way, relevance, research to address global challenges, and finally, global collaborations, and, 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 and uh, Nazareth University really is an example with all its strategic partnerships whereby world-class universities can act as a community cooperating for the global good. Thank you, Jamil. I think you um, challenged us all. You set the tone. Let me now call on Professor Laura. I make, have to make sure that I pronounce it correctly. Professor Poole Warren. She is the Pro Vice Chancellor and also in charge of research training and the Dean of Graduate Research at the University of New South Wales in Australia, Sydney. Um, for simpletons like me, who all only thought that you only have a univer National University of Australia and maybe the University of Melbourne, um, a few years ago, our, our uh, Vice Provost for Academic Affairs, Loretta, also told me that there are other universities. And, and, and among them, the University of New South Wales is actually a very, very prominent university. So I have the pleasure uh, and honor to, to welcome uh, Laura, who is going to reflect a little bit on what Jamil introduced in terms of the future of learning, high education, in the context, actually, of, an, of the University of New South Wales. The floor is yours. Thank you very much, President Katsu. It's very nice to be here. Can you hear me? Is that good? Great. Um, so, good morning, Salem. It's very nice to be here. Just a quick mic check here. A bit higher up. Okay. That's better? Yes, I can hear myself now. So it's lovely to be here at Nazarbayev University and um, I would like to thank President Katsu for I guess the in inspiration of pulling together this forum and particularly on this topic which I think is very relevant to all of us in all of our universities. And I'm coming at it from the perspective of being in the division of research at our university. And anybody who is in a division of research in a large research intensive university knows that research is the part of the business that costs money. And for every dollar that we get in to fund our research, we have to spend 50 cents or a dollar to actually keep the research effort going. And that is often cross-subsidized by our students. So this is a real challenge, I think, um, of our business models today. And let's face it, I think we are big businesses. And I will touch upon some of those things. I would really like to thank um, Dr. Salmi for his 
broad reaching, very global introduction to the challenges. And I think that from the perspective of the Division of Research and producing new researchers and really um, making sure that we're doing globally impactful research meets a lot of those requirements, a lot of those um, sustainable development goals, etc. So I just really quickly want to let you know what the University of New South Wales looks like. We are a very large institution, so we have over 50,000 students. Approximately 8% of those are higher degree researchers, so that's our PhDs and Masters by Research. That's pretty typical across the big research intensive universities in Australia. And we're a fairly young university. So we were formed in 1949, we're 70 years old next year. And we have a fairly traditional, comprehensive list of faculties that you can see there. So we do cover engineering, medicine, science are our largest, but basically we have a very strong arts and social sciences, art and design, business, etc. The other point I just wanted to make from this slide is that Starting in 2016, our new Vice Chancellor at that time, Professor Ian Jacobs, who came to us from the United Kingdom, launched our Strategy 2025, which basically headlined with $3 billion additional investment on top of our operating investment into strategy. So I'll be telling you a little bit about what that's all about. This is a, a, a quick picture of our Sydney campus. You can see here the campus. And then this is one of our teaching hospitals up here. And out here, this is the Pacific Ocean. So we're very, very close to the ocean. And we're about seven kilometers away from the city. So we're, we're an inner city university. But in many ways, Australia is actually quite like Kazakhstan, very large landmass and very small population. We're a very big country and we only have 25 million people. We have another campus which is based in Canberra and this is our national capital and again, very like Astana. It was actually a built capital. It was designed as our capital and built from scratch. Um, so it's a new planned city designed by um, Walter Burley Griffin and um, our university campus there actually services our Defence Force Academy. So it teaches all of the cadets, etc. And that's just showing you the campus right here. So moving on to the disruptive age in research. And I, I listed some of these things because I thought they might resonate with you in your universities as they do with us. And I think the, the disruptive influences that we're really challenged with by at the moment are the fact that we need to compete to attract the best researchers. We are in a global business and yes, higher education is a business. We in Australia, it's one of our largest export industries. We attract enormous numbers of international candidates or students who come into the, the country and so we need to make sure that we're providing a world-class experience. That means we need to have the best people. And around the world, there is unprecedented investment going into higher education. Um, I think we heard yesterday that China is really working towards having 40 top-tier universities, high-ranking universities. We have 40 universities across the whole of Australia. So I think the scale of competition out there for the best minds is absolutely critical. So I think the second point there is that we, don't, we shouldn't just be looking at recruitment. We should also be looking at developing and retaining our own staff, so growing our own people in our, in our regions, but also bringing early career people up to leadership um, levels. Now nationally we have several challenges and some of these may resonate with you. So we have quite a challenge with security of research funding, shrinking research funding pots and as I said cross-subsidized research funding 
from our teaching revenue. We also have a lot of global challenges that we need to address. And as we've already talked about in this disruptive age, technology driven, the amounts of data that we have to work with are massive. So we do have to um, work, I think, do more and more on less and less. So we have to be much more efficient. And trying to sell efficiency to academics is very, very difficult. So I think, <laughs> so I think that certainly is one of our big challenges nationally. I think this is another point that um, Australia is challenged with, but I'm, I'm quite interested in hearing our previous speakers, that there is this big drive towards very applied, industry-linked, STEM-based research. So two M's there because not only mathematics but medicine. And while I think that is something which you can argue on an economic basis, I think if we don't include our arts humanities, social sciences, business, and law in the equation, we have a much poorer offering. We're not really addressing the grand challenges, which are interdisciplinary. They're not just based on our sciences and technology. Despite being a biomedical engineer, I see this as absolutely critical. And we do have a lot of drivers nationally being placed on us um, towards this applied STEM research. The third area that's a real challenge is renewal and maintenance of world-class infrastructures. And this is not just buildings, it's also support services, IT, the soft infrastructure. And, you know, this is developing at a great pace. Technology is changing at such a huge pace now that keeping up with it and making sure that you have the best systems to support all of your administration and all of your teaching and all of your research is a, is a resource intensive and very difficult area. So we're certainly challenged by that. Finally, and this is an area very close to my heart, um, I think we do have to really look at our diversity. And this is not just gender, it's also cultural diversity. And in particular, looking at who's running our universities and, and who are in the leadership teams and who are in the professoriate. And do we have a representative group there in the professoriate leading our research, leading our universities? So I think we have to grapple with that much more. And that's certainly a, a thing that is a national goal and I'm sure it's something that is also a global goal. But I'm not so sure where everybody's up to on that. So I'm just very quickly going to talk a little bit about our strategy and about how we're addressing some of these goals. And I'm trying to just check out how I'm going for time. I'm going to have to zip through these very quickly because I've been told I have 15 minutes and I think President Katsu will hook me off if I don't finish in 15 minutes. <coughs> so, as I said, in 2015 we launched our strategy, Australia's global university with a vision to really transform lives through excellence, through our academic excellence, through our research excellence. And it's, it's unashamedly ambitious, I think, is what our Vice-Chancellor says. And so starting in 2016, we commenced under these three pillars. And they're very ordinary pillars. They're, they're pillars which it should be no surprise to anybody. But what is, I think, exciting is that they are all actually given equal emphasis, if not equal funding, but they are given equal emphasis. And that's the fact that we want to have research quality alongside educational quality. So we want to have excellence across both of those areas. Social engagement, we want to make sure that we are actually an equitable and just organisation and that we're giving back, so we're exchanging our knowledge for impact with end users. And finally, global impact. So what we want to do is make sure that we are reaching out and we are giving back globally, so that we're not just inward looking, looking in towards our own university. But I'm gonna be focusing on the research quality aspects of the strategy. I won't be going into the other areas mainly because the research part is the part that I was involved with developing. So you can see that the three billion that I mentioned, 
approximately two billion of that is going into research quality. And I'll explain why that overarching and, and overwhelming proportion is going into research in a little while. But basically the other areas, the operational environment, social engagement, global impact, and the educational excellence, which is focusing a lot on the educational experience, digitalization, etc. I think that all of them are working together and there is crossover in a lot of them. But in the research quality area, what we're looking at is really investing in people. And I think the second thing which is required is, because people form part of the environment, is actually making sure that we're investing in our infrastructure so that we have people plus the environment. And you can see here that there, are, there is a fairly significant um, investment that is going into the people and the infrastructure. So moving forward, in terms of the strategic programs, we have three key strategic programs underneath our people section. The, the first is really attracting and retaining top 1% researchers. And that's really over the period to 2025, attracting in 100 of the top 1% around the world, but also making sure that we're retaining our own top researchers. We have, and these next two programs, the Cientia Fellowship Program and the Cientia PhD Program, are ones that I was the leader in basically um, pulling together the strategy and implementing. The first are fellowships, and that's for attracting and retaining early to mid-career researchers. We'll be recruiting 300 up to 2025. And then our Scientia PhD scholarships, and that's recruiting 700 up to 2025. Now, this is on top of our normal recruitment. This is a, a specific strategic investment. And what's different and distinctive about these two schemes there are a few distinctive aspects, but one I really want to focus on, and that is that it's not just about the depth, the technical depth. It's not just about having the best people. We have a requirement at application, so before we accept people, to actually have a look at what else they've done apart from just focusing on the brilliance that they have. So we're looking at what else have they done? Where have they worked? What other experiences have they done? Have they been involved in industry? Have they been involved with NGOs? What other experience have they had? And what are they bringing into the university so that that will help them lead to impacting in the future? But the second really distinctive thing is that instead of giving them money to do research, the, the program actually expects them to be able to attract funding. So the fellows come in. They are given startup packages by the faculties, but they're expected to ultimately attract their own research funding. What they do get is a package for career and professional development, and they get career coaching. And that is laid on from the very beginning. And this is an amazing um, cultural change for academics to go through. And I think that um, I'm very happy to, to talk more about that, but. This is a really, um, this has been the biggest change, I think, that we've, we've um, introduced across these programs. The Cienti PhD scholars also have a smaller package, but it is also around career development and talking about career. So in the interest of time, I'm just very quickly also going to mention research infrastructure, because without fantastic infrastructure, it's very difficult to actually be able to support all of our people. And one of the defining features of the strategic research infrastructure investment is that it's collaborative. So that what we're doing is we're looking at producing facilities that are used university-wide. They're not locked up in one building or another. They're accessible by all staff because they're centrally managed and centrally funded. And the other thing is, is they also inter interact with industry and with other universities and external organisations. So the shared facility model is used very much to make sure that we can keep up with all of the, the technology. We can invest more by having less redundancy. So we've done this through um, various 
Aries, our analytical centre, which has all of the big kit for various types of analysis. We have a biomedical imaging facility, which has everything from the MRIs right through to um, fluorescent microscopes, light sheet microscopes, etc. All shared, all accessible online for bookings, etc. Um, and another example is our solar industry research facility, which is a facility which um, is a pilot scale um, production scale for um, silicon based solar cells. So I think I'm going to finish up there because I think I've run out of time. Um, and I think just the last point there is that global networks are absolutely key. And I'm very happy to be here and I'm very happy um, to be meeting all of you. And these um, are some of the global networks that the University of New South Wales has. But one that I didn't put on there is, in fact, the University Alliance of the Silk Road, which we are actually part of. So <laughs> I'm hoping that through that we can reach out and um, work more with some of you. And I'd just like to end um, with a picture. Um, I was recently down near Almaty, and this is your part of um, the beautiful countryside that I saw. And uh, thank you very much. Our third speaker for this opening session is uh, Dr. Stavros, Stavros Yunukas, who is um, to the, known to the a new community as uh, having been the executive vice dean of the Lee Kuan Yew uh, School for Public Policy of the National University of Singapore. And he was uh, with us at, from the very beginning when we uh, built up our public policy school. But then um, he was called on to head something that I am really excited about and I try to attend as much as possible. That is the World Innovation Summit on Education, which is um, organized, sponsored uh, by Qatar. Uh, and um, those of you who have never been there, I certainly encourage you to, to uh, visit. Uh, because in a way it's like a, um, it, it, it's like a, you know, for children you have toy shops and for educators or anybody who is interested in education research, there's WISE. Um, over a few days you have a full range and mind-boggling range of insights as to what are the latest trends, what are the latest discoveries and insight with respect to all levels of, uh, of education. And I always come back very much inspired and very much uh, sort of, uh, you know, energized when I then try to translate what I've learned into things that would be of benefit for our university, for the education system here in Kazakhstan. So Stavros, you're on. I hope that he, he has had ample time to reflect and listen to the two presentations from the global to the specific research university case. And uh, I hope that uh, Stavros will give us his views as to what he then, how he ties the global together with the local or the specific and what insights indeed WISE can share with us. And, uh, the floor is yours. In the meantime, I do hope that you have started to ask questions using the pigeonhole facility. Thank you. Thank you, Shigo. I think that was, that was a, a hint that I, I didn't prepare a slide and presentation to, uh, to share with you today. But, but I do have remarks that um, I was thinking about this on the way over. Um, the, the topic of our discussion today is innovation uh, in higher education in an age of disruption. And the first thing that I asked myself when I began preparing for this uh, discussion was, is the world really experiencing disruption? 
And I think on, on the surface, I think the answer is, is yes. Uh, Shigeo, in your remarks, you alluded to what's happening across the, the Atlantic and the, the, the challenge to the, the sort of liberal international order that was, was created after the Second World War. Um, clearly, we are you know, experiencing some challenges in the, in the geopolitical uh, realm. Um, in the economic sphere as well, there are challenges too. We, we're seeing a resurgence of mercantilism. You know, countries are, are starting to uh, talk and, 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 and actually impose tariffs, um, which could threaten to reverse one of the big success stories of the post-1945 order, which is the, the massive increase in trade uh, and what we've come to know as, as globalization that has linked us all together. Um, Jamil, in your remarks, you alluded to the, the technological transformations that are taking place, AI, robotics, automation, all these things are uh, at some level potentially threatening uh, to displace uh, very, very many uh, workers from uh, both white and blue collar jobs. Um, and then of course we have, you know, we, we have a significant youth bulge uh, concentrated primarily in Africa and South Asia uh, that will see the population of, of the planet continue to grow um, at a large uh, clip. We're looking at 9 to 10 billion people by, by the end of the, the century. Um, so disruption, yes. But I also think we need to put what's happening in the context of what's been going on in the past 200 years. And the past 200 years have been remarkable by the standards of, 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 uh, of the human experience. Um, since the Industrial Revolution, all indicators that have to do with human development have been trending upwards. Life expectancy is, is growing. Um, I was quite surprised to, to, to learn, I'm, I'm reading a book, uh, al almost finished now, uh, Steven Pinker's new book, Enlightenment Now. And he spends two-thirds of the book really going into very, very uh, fine detail, um, documenting with data the progress that has been achieved. I was quite surprised to learn that the average life expectancy across the planet is now 70 years. I thought it would be less, given, given that we still have pockets of poverty. It's 70 years. The world economy has been growing year on year pretty much since the, the Great uh, uh, Depression. Even during the Great Recession of 2008-9, the world economy continued to grow. And so people have been getting wealthier. Most countries now, most people live in middle-income countries now. As uh, the great, late, great Hans Rosling uh, says, there is no gap anymore. There is no poor countries and rich countries with a big gap in between. Most countries are now filling that gap. Um, and the good news from a higher education perspective is what happens when people get wealthier? They want more education. There's a very, very strong correlation. I did some analysis. It's probably a little dated now. But there was a 67% correlation between growth in per capita GDP and enrollment in higher education. Um, and those of us who have been in the industry, who have observed the industry over the past 30 years, we have witnessed a tremendous explosion in demand for higher education. So we can expect demand to continue to grow. So then what is the likely impact? Disruption, yes, but I think we need to put it in historical context. And, and for me, it's a good news story, by and large, for higher education. We, we have a product that is going to be in demand. As more and more people join the middle classes, they will aspire, they will want for themselves and for their kids to be educated. So the biggest challenge, perhaps, I think, that we have to face is how are we going to absorb this new demand? 
How are we going to make sure that the legitimate aspirations of millions of young people to get a world-class education are met, given that universities are expensive, we, we just heard the amazing investments that are happening in, in, uh, at the University of New South Wales. They don't come cheap. Universities don't come cheap. Faculty take a long time to train, a long time. So how are we going to meet this demand? How are we going to ensure that the kind of education that we're going to give our young people uh, is relevant for them, not just in terms of their uh, job aspirations, um, but also in dealing with a world that, that maybe it's not as volatile, I like the VUCA analogy, but maybe it's not as volatile as we think it is. We, we, you know, hindsight is always 2020, right? So we tend to look at the past and think that it was all quite ordered and we, you know, and, and we always look ahead and think, oh, the world is, is volatile now. I, I would challenge us to think back to where we were, you know, 20, 30 years ago. I don't think the world looked quite as orderly as it does now when we look back. Um, but in any event, the world is complex, the world is changing, and, and we have to prepare our young people for that. And then, I think very importantly uh, for us as universities, how do we ensure that the current I'm going to call it a disruptive phase. I don't want to call it an age. I'm not going to give it the, the, uh, the, the benefit of, or the, the compliment of, of declaring it a disruptive age yet. The disruptive phase. How are we going to ensure that it doesn't affect us as, as a, a higher education industry? So how do we meet the challenges and where are the opportunities? So the first thing that, that I want to say, and I think it, it, it echoed in, in the remarks of, of Jamil and, and Laura, research universities are a core infrastructure for the 21st century. There is no country, large, medium, or small, that aspires to make its mark on the world that isn't investing in higher education. Um, and I think it would be myopic of uh, countries with aspirations not to invest in, in higher education. Um, universities are a main driver of economic growth, but they're also a main driver of, of very much more. They, they generate public goods, and again, Jamil, you, I think, illustrated that very, very interesting, uh, very well with that chart where you looked at the sustainable development goals and you put X's against where research universities can contribute. Um, and, you know, I think one thing that countries, though, that governments in particular need to learn is to be patient with universities because the returns from universities do not come about in months, years, quarters. They take decades, but it's worth the investment. Um, but I think also Governments, and here, you know, we are in, a, in, a, uh, in an elite, exclusive, research-intensive university. We have to, though, acknowledge that higher education, and, and as governments and investors think about higher education, we need to take a portfolio approach. We can't have everybody going to uh, research-intensive uh, universities. You know, the education that's provided here needs to be supplemented by TVET, community colleges, um, apprenticeship systems. We need a portfolio approach to, to higher education. The second, I think, opportunity challenge and, and, and opportunity is universities need to get a lot more creative about how, what they offer in terms of education how they offer it, and when they offer it. Again, Jamil alluded to some of these things, but let me add, uh, add some more of, of my own thinking on this. Um, again, because of the, the pressures of academic life, research universities tend to want to focus quite narrowly. 
it's good for academic career. It's good for an academic career if you pick a you know a, an area and you get really good at that area, and it's even better if if there aren't too many people, you know, <laughs> already already active in that area. I would argue that's not necessarily what's good for most people and most uh, most students. So I'm a big advocate of broad-based education. I think what in the US would be described as a liberal arts education. Um, Jamil, you talked about Master of Fine Arts being, being better than an MBA. As, as an MBA, I would be inclined to actually agree. Um, you know, and then I think we need, but you know, not to, not to let the artists off the hook. Um, we also suffer today from growing scientific illiteracy. So I actually think that in the same way that it's, it's, you're considered cultured, if you know a little bit of Shakespeare or a little bit of Tolstoy, you should be required to understand the laws of thermodynamics. That's what drives the universe. How can you not know anything about thermodynamics? No matter what you're doing, if you're an artist, a poet, you should still understand some basic science. And there's an interesting uh, uh, new institution in, uh, in the UK um, set up by Professor Grayling, uh, probably one of the, the world's uh, most insightful living philosophers. Uh, it's called the New College of the Humanities. And scientific literacy is a core course for everybody. Equally, though, our scientists need to be exposed to the humanities. They need to be able to understand something about human nature, and they need to be able to understand about the implications of hu on human behavior, on society, of some of the design choices that they're making as scientists, or some of the discoveries that they're putting forward. They have to be able to consider those, the ethical implications. So I think in terms of what we teach, at universities, I think we need to get a lot more ambitious and a lot broader. Now, the, the how. Well, again, I, I don't want to repeat, but you know, if universities are still spending a disproportionate amount of teaching time in lecture theaters, I think that's really, I, I, don't, I, don't, I can't excuse that anymore. I mean, lectures should be recorded, filmed, put on uh, online with sort of interesting support material, and you should be spending face-to-face -face time with students doing some of the things that Jamil talked about. Problem solving, challenging each other, debating, discussing, advancing the thinking uh, and the learning. I think you, you said it's interactive, engaging, all those, all those good, good, good words. And then the when, when we teach. And again, universities, and it, it's starting to happen. Stanford introduced recently a, um, a model of education where you, you can go in and out of the university pretty much for as, as long as you want and take courses and work towards a degree at your time, your pace. You can combine it with work experience. It's building a lifelong relationship between the learner and the university. And I think we've got to move, universities need to move towards that. It's also a great opportunity. Continuing education, lifelong learning. This is a great opportunity to build a lifetime uh, customer base, if you want to think in terms of, of business. My final point, and then I'll, I'll stop. We talked uh, quite a bit about values. Right? All, all uh, the two previous speakers spoke about values. Shigeo, you put values up uh, in your presentation front and center. Universities are underpinned by, by certain core, core values. Uh, chief amongst them, respect for the substantiated truth. And that's what we're all about at the end of the day. If, if 
If there is no objective reality capable of being discovered, then we're all out of business. So respect for the substantiated truth is value number one. But there are also other values. Meritocracy was, was mentioned. Um, the ability to, to have compassion, to empathize. These are all core to the enterprise. In fact, they're core to the very disciplines that we, we teach, we research, we learn from. You can't do science without respecting substantiated truth. You can't do social sciences unless you're prepared to deal with complexity, with nuance, and, and, and abandon ideology. And you can't do literature and art unless you're prepared to empathize and have some compassion for the people that are, uh, whose lives you're being exposed to through great works of literature and art. And so I want to end my remarks by, by saying that as, as universities, as, as academics, as professionals, we need to st step up and stand up for those values. And those values are being challenged. If there's one thing I worry about, it's not the disruption from AI or you know, or, or automation. I think we, you know, we've, we've seen a lot of disruption, as I said, over the, the past 200 uh, years. Electrification, flight, you know, automobiles. E, you know, I mean, with all due respect, you know, the internet is great, but still has some way to go before it matches the impact of those, those transformations. It may well get there. I'm not too worried about that. What I'm worried about is that the values on which universities are built are coming under attack. And those are the values that we need to stand up for. Thank you. Thank you. Yes, please stay here. Okay, uh, let's see whether this format works. Um, I think, Jamil, if you could sort of come up a little bit more forward so that we can see each other better. Okay, uh, I hope you all have enjoyed the uh, three presentations as much as I did. I think um, we have just heard um, a, very, a series of very um, thoughtful yet thought-provoking presentations. Um, and now we want to engage you, the audience. And um, I hope that we start to see some of the questions bubbling up. In the meantime, while we start to uh, get look what, what you all have thought, I just wanted to, to tell um, Stavros that actually about the VUCA world, you know, uh, it's a term that's not actually from today. It's a term that dates back to the early 50s. And, you know, as you rightly said, they already thought about the future being VUCA. In hindsight, though, I still do believe it was very much VUCA for the times. Um, and as you said, that with the acceleration of technology, as we also have heard, and the, mind, and the human mind not actually progressing at the same speed, or change, you shouldn't say progressing, yeah. but changing at the same speed, something has to give. And that, I think, is going to be the VUCA side in whatever you know, alphabetic uh, configuration you want to, to, to see. Now, let's see what you have thought. And let's start with one that received the most votes. It says, 
how do you understand disruptive innovation within the educational context? Um, and is it an opportunity for universities to become competitively globally or a threat to the existing business models? So I think um, let's hear from each of you because I think we all are concerned about it. Jamil. <coughs> Two days ago, I was in Hong Kong at the University of Hong Kong, and the registrar from the university came and talked. It was a summer institute, and one of the sessions was about governance. And the registrar, in first conclusion after his presentation, uh, stayed with me because I think he made a very important point. He said that any university that tells you that they are doing fine, is in big trouble. And I think Shigeo himself mentioned the word complacency. I think what is happening today, whether it's a phase or an age of disruption as uh, Stavros challenges to think, it means that things are changing very fast. And we can either let things happen to us or we can have a proactive approach and say, how do we seize on the opportunities and how do we protect ourselves from potential threats to our business model? Since I was mentioning the register, I will mention a last register to finish this point. I had a friend who was a register of Oxford. He's now retired. And he was telling me that his life nowadays was very difficult because Oxford is very poor as a university Meanwhile, the colleges are very rich, but this structure that made sense 800 years ago doesn't make sense today. And so if you were to reinvent Oxford University today, maybe you would not do it very differently. Thank you. Laura? So I'll, I'll come back to the people aspect, as I always do. And I think that um, in terms of what I understand as the, the really big disruption in our higher education institutions is about preparation of our academic staff workforce. And I think that our academic staff um, have worked in a certain way for many years and they're being asked to step up and to change. And there's a huge culture change going on, both in terms of you know, how they handle um, the, the academic teaching side of things, teaching and learning side of things, and how they're dealing with their research and how they're leading and managing. So we have to really, I think, upskill our academics, but we have to do an even harder thing, which is change the culture. And culture change is, I think, incredibly difficult. Um, as a sort of a student of culture change and somebody who, it, it, being in the research portfolio, it's something that um, we're, we're actually very good change agents because things um, are always moving and changing and it's very competitive. I think that we need to work out really how to engage best with our academic staff to make sure that, that we are putting in place the right sorts of development programs and coaching and career assistance so that they can actually deal with the change and the workload changes and all of that side of things. And I think the second part of the question is, you know, is this an opportunity for universities to become competitive globally or a threat? I think it's both. I think it has to be both. Um, because, yes, our business models are um, likely to be changing going into the future. And um, that is part of, of um, the culture change that we have to get in place for our academics to get them to really work with new business models, work with, you know, a lot more... Um, remote um, enrollment, a lot more collaboration, a lot more um, data, etc., etc. All of these things, we have to work out how to, to do that. So. Stavros, you may want to maybe elaborate a little bit more further yeah. on your ideas of lifelong relationships yeah. with, uh, with the customer. Well, I mean, j just, I mean, first, first, I think we need to. When we look at universities, I mean, universities have been around for about a thousand years, the institution. Uh, and obviously it's not the same institution that it 
that that was you know created in um, you know depending on on where you think it all started you know it, it's either Egypt or or Italy or Spain or, um, you know th this is an industry that has adapted I think rather well it is a successful industry by the standards of of, of almost of almost any other um, and, and so I do think that universities <coughs> will adapt now you know w w w of course again we're talking about a very now diverse uh, industry and I think the universities that are most likely to get into trouble are the old uh, uh, state-funded universities. I'm thinking mainly around, around Europe at the moment, parts of the Middle East as well, where you know, the model is still massive lecture theaters, you know, 200, 300 students, somebody you know, sitting in the front droning on for a couple of hours and then you know, they go off and, and, and do what, whatever they do. I mean, those, those guys w at some point will, you know, will either have to change or they will wither. I worry less about universities such as this one and, 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 and New South Wales because you, know, they, you already operate in, in a very competitive market and you're, you're worrying about the fact that you're worrying about what's coming next is a, is a good sign. The fact that we're having these conversations is a good sign that you know, you're on the way to adapting the model, or at least you're open to thinking about how to adapt the model and how to respond. Um, in terms of what, I, what I've seen through, through WISE, you know, we, we've seen, you know, I, 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 last month I was in, in Ghana visiting our uh, most recent Wise Prize for Education laureate. Um, he's he's a, a Ghanaian in his in his forties. He left Microsoft um, uh, sometime in the in the sort of nineties, and decided that he was going to set up a high quality um, liberal arts uh, university in 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 Ghana, some some two hours outside of Accra, <coughs> Ashesi, yeah. And, you know, I, I was just, it, it was amazing to visit this place. He's now got 1,000 students enrolled, and he's preparing for 2,000 in the next uh, two or three years. He's going to double. And it's built on the liberal arts model, um, but, it, but it's also the, the setup there is, is fully sustainable in terms of water. They're water independent. They derive 30% of their uh, energy needs from solar. Um, just, just an incredible environment. So, so the model has, has legs. I mean, you know, here's someone who says, look, I'm going to try and create a, a Harvard or sort of an Ivy League experience two hours outside of, of Accra in, in, in a remote hill village. And he's doing it. So the model has work, you know, has, has legs. Um, but again, it's, it's a model that depends on high levels of interaction between teachers and students, highly motivated students that want to learn, that take control of their learning. All these things can, can, can work. So I, I agree. It's, I think there's opportunity, definitely opportunity. Jamil, let me ask you a question. And I think, I mean, I'm, I digress a little bit from, from, from this uh, list of questions maybe. But, you know, <clears throat> and it's probably on the minds of many people here in Kazakhstan. Government has invested massively in Nazarbayev University. We've introduced a totally, for Kazakhstan, disruptive way of education, new ways and so forth. And now we're embarking, obviously, doing similar on research side. But there are enough people who wonder, is it really possible for Kazakhstan, or maybe some other places in Central Asia and so, to really develop a world-class research university? Are we able to attract global talent, and what are we to do with our own talent that we developed? Aren't we risking brain drain or you know, developing our brains for somebody else's benefit? You have done a lot of research the, uh, about you know, fast rising universities and so. Um, tell us what, what you think about you know, this endeavor type, or not just Nazarbayev University, but you know, how do middle income countries that are trying to break in and, and 
you know, become part of the top countries, how can they actually develop top-notch universities? And will it, is it possible? I think it starts with a dream, and then working hard to make it reality. And before I come back to Kazakhstan, let me talk a minute about Hong Kong. 25 years ago, so Hong Kong has already established universities, Hong, University of Hong Kong, very prestigious, and then somebody decides to establish a new university called Hong Kong University of Science and Technology. How do you start a new university next to a very good university? And they had a different model, more inspired by the US, and they brought people from the diaspora, so the first president, all the researchers, young and more experienced, where most of them were Chinese from the diaspora. And today, Hong Kong University of Science and Technology is in the, among the top five in Asia. So it is definitely possible. And frankly, because I've had the privilege of watching uh, Nazarbayev University from even before it was um, the building started, and I'm not saying that it, it went very smoothly. I'm not saying that everything that was done at the beginning was the right way of doing it. But honestly, and I'm not trying to be polite because I'm, I'm here today, it's amazing what has been achieved. So I think it is possible. Uh, Stavros just talked about Aseshipo College. There is a college also in the US called All-In College of Engineering, also brand new. 15 miles south of MIT. How dare you open a new school of engineering 50 miles away from MIT? And yet, it is in my book today one of the most revolutionary schools of engineering today. So if you have the dream, and without mentioning any country, I have worked in other countries in this part of the world where you also have money, but you don't have a dream. And so their higher education system has been stagnant. Kazakhstan has invested a lot, you know, starting with the Bolashak uh, scholarship program. So if you have a dream, you create a vision, and then you work hard at it, and you will achieve it. The only thing, don't try to imitate the others. Define something that is unique to your culture and to your specific environment. That's how you become a great university. I could, I could just, just add to that. I think that, that it's, it's important to also remember that higher education is not a one-size-fits-all one model. And, and it, 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 there are many pathways to success. So again, one of my favorite uh, uh, people to talk to is, is uh, Dr. Eduardo Padron, the, the president of Miami-Dade College in, in, in the US. He's done amazing things with a community college. It, it, I mean, it, it, University of New South Wales is, is big with 56,000. They've got 170,000 students. And, you know, community colleges, in the, for those who know, in the U.S., they're, they're sort of the, at the bottom of the, you know, of, of, of the, the status uh, uh, ladder when it comes to higher education. But it's, it's been transformed. It's been transformed with industry partnerships, with you know, very much a focus on uh, uh, degrees that train and prepare people for the workplace. Uh, again, open access uh, model. It's not selective. Uh, you can you know, go in and out um, and, and uh, throughout your, your, your working life. Um, and, I, and I asked him, one of the things I asked him, I said, you know, Dr. Padron, what, what happens to the, you know, so you, you get people usually from, from underprivileged backgrounds. Uh, and then you, 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 you train them and they, they go off and they have these great careers. Where do they send their kids? And remarkably, a very high degree of loyalty from, from, uh, from, from the alumni. Going back, you know, there, there's another uh, uh, very interesting innovation uh, that I'm familiar with. It's called Minerva College. This is uh, a, a uh, an Ivy League university without a campus, without any infrastructure, using the, the infrastructure of different cities to, to deliver an education. So there are multiple pathways to, to success. I don't think we, all, we need to get so hung up about, you know, every university in Kazakhstan needs to be like Nazarbayev University. 
I think as Jamil said, you've got to find your niche, um, not just as a country, but as, a, as an institution. Thank you. Thank you. Let's go back to some of these questions. Um, Laura, if you want to pick up some that are addressed to you, the one with the 21 votes sure. on people and how to develop university leaders and some others. <coughs> Sure. Um, look, I think that one of the things we need to remember when we're talking about people and developing people is that we, it's not one size fits all. We don't have people appearing before us as a, a blank canvas. They come with different experiences through um, their education, through their upbringing, through their culture, and um, you need to also think about another aspect, which is um, the, the sort of the learning and development model which has been hypothesized, I think it was back in the 80s, is that 70% of what we learn is actually through on-the-job experience. Mm. And another 20% is actually from our peers and, and from people around us. And then it's only 10% that really comes from um, our formal learning, formal courses and things like that. So I think that when you're talking about developing our people and developing talent, you need to think about that model and how you're actually working with people every day. And I'm not suggesting that universities should forget about the depth and the excellence and the, um, you know, having really being focused on generating new knowledge because I think that is really um, what universities can do and, and are all about. You know, it's, pretty much my core business. But I think that breadth and, and the developing development of skills which are transferable into other industries is absolutely critical. Because I think as our higher education institutions grow and as we produce more highly trained people, not only um, undergrads but of course our PhDs, we have to actually be preparing them for the fact that they may not be going into an academic role. Um, and, and so I think that um, I would, for a young university, I would say number one, you, know, you need to actually develop your, your mentors in your university to actually be able to have the career conversations. And it's not an easy thing to do and academics aren't trained to do it. So I think we have to do that first of all. We have to make sure our, our staff are very well aware of, of how to have that sort of career conversation and how to really talk about the realities of, of whether this is the place for, for you as a, as a, as a career. Um, and then I think also that with our, our young people coming in and the people that we're growing and we want to put um, on those firm leadership trajectories, make sure that we do give them opportunities and experiences for leadership and so that they can learn on the job, but also couple that with the, the formal sort of training. So I guess that's in a nutshell what I would suggest. Thank you. Let's go back to the list of questions and see which ones are eliciting most. From the audience, which one do you want me to pick up? According to the votes or any particular one that you are energized about? The one votes. with 16 votes to Jamil. Okay, so you, <laughs> you, you told us about you, the vision. Have you got three hours? <laughs> now you have to tell us the how to get there. I think it's, I think I've already mentioned it, don't allow other people to define your vision. Have your idea and develop it and then work at it. I developed a simple model that Shigeo was kind enough to mention in his opening remarks that what makes any great tertiary education institution, whether you're talking about a community college or world-class research universities, is combining these three sets of factors, talent, resources, and government. Resources, it's obvious, you know, you need money, and, and, but people often think it's all about resources. I could mention many universities that are very rich, and yet they are not very good. So its governance is even more important, having flexibility, 
empowerment, autonomy, academic freedom, etc. And that allows talent to develop, to thrive. Talent comes from the students. And it doesn't mean that you get necessarily the best students. You know, we could argue, no offense meant to Harvard graduates, that Harvard is number one in the world, but you know, it's not too difficult if you're so selective. All the, uh, the Indian Institutes of Technology, they, they get one out of 100 candidates. Harvard gets one out of 12. And then they have the top professors because they are rich. No, it's the value that you add. You take your pool of talent and you add value. And that's what the some of the community colleges do very well in the US or Canada. And the professors, because at the end of the day, really what defines a university is the quality of the professors. And Laura mentioned something very important, is the mindset. It's, are you humble enough to accept that your role is changing from being the person who knew it all to a kind of facilitator, guide, mentor. And accept also that just because I have a PhD and I'm an expert in my domain doesn't mean that I'm a good teacher in terms of transmission of knowledge. We have a proverb in Morocco, in my country, which says, the good lawyers are those that learn by defending orphans in court. And I think something similar happens with many professors that we start teaching without having any clue about what is good teaching. And some of us learn and some never learn. And again, we have to be humble, challenge ourselves, and then we can implement the new vision. Laura? Could I just add to that? Because I think one of the things that, that strikes me is that um, we, we often do have a vision, but we're very much constrained by government influences. You know, even in Australia, with a, a democratic government, we're very much um, constrained by government influences and drivers that they place on us. And, and so I think that um, the, you know, wherever we can, we, we need to be lobbying government to, to, to really make sure that we can um, be more flexible in our business models and, and you know, have, have the policy changes that are actually going to um, support a diversification in our university systems. And you know, many years ago in Australia, we had um, an education minister called Dawkins who came in and basically removed all of the colleges of advanced education, so the teachers' colleges, and combined them all into sort of larger conglomerations and, and turned them all into universities. And so we, we ended up with this sort of broad range of you know, research intensive right down to very teaching intensive and very little research. And over the period of time since then, the, the funding models haven't changed. And so everybody is trying to be research intensive. And that is bad for the country. And, and you know, there is a lot of lobbying going on in Australia about higher education reform and, and how we can do that. But it's incredibly, incredibly political because we're a very large country and our regional areas have quite a lot of power in terms of balance of power in, in the Senate and in Parliament. So, so I think as leaders in higher education, we also need to take on the mantle of being you know, lobbyists, which is another skill that we have to get, so that we can talk to government and that we can lobby and that we can form alliances to be able to um, you know, really get systems that are going to support diversification, which I think is the way of the future. Thank you. Let's move back to some of the questions. Which one? Hmm? It's yours. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> so um, we have from Patrick Dupac, who is our dean of the business school, this question about you know transferability of the NU model to other universities here in the context of a very or tightening public purse. 
in the context of us having been given so many privileges that are difficult for others to catch up, even though we try. Who wants to, who wants to give us a way forward? <laughs> I, I mean, to, to a certain extent, we sort of ad, ad addressed it, right? I mean, in, the, in that clearly the, 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 the full model is, is expensive. You have, you know, you have the international partnerships, and 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 you have uh, uh, obviously a, a massive uh, investment in infrastructure. That is obviously not easy to replicate uh, on uh, in any scale. What can be transferred, though, I, I believe, is are the principles on which NU is is founded that you very nicely articulated in in in, in the chart. I think those, those can be tra transferred. Teaching excellence can be transferred. Um, autonomy uh, can be transferred. Okay, I guess everybody wants to pitch in here. <laughs> well, along Laura? Yes. Uh, Laura? <laughs> Laura yes. Yes. So I had, I had some great conversations last night at, at dinner about um, the educational developers and educational technology that's happening here. And I think that, um, that some of the initiatives are absolutely fantastic. You know, really you know, getting a lot of tablet but not web-based resources so that, you know, people remotely located can have a download all of their courseware onto their tablet but not have to access the, the internet, which can be difficult in remote places. And I think that as a young university, you've um, been able to really get out there on a limb and develop some of these things. And I think that that, you, you actually are right up there at the cutting edge and that can be transferable to other universities. It's, I think, more difficult to big established universities to do it. So I think we can learn from the young universities who are really going out there on a limb with, um, with some really innovative teaching. And I think investing in that is absolutely critical. Thank you. Yeah, along the same lines. First, you have many innovations that do not cost anything. They cost a lot of mind change, but the technology is, is there to, uh, to, for example, peer learning. You have web-based software that, that are free, et cetera. The second point is, as Stavros had the line, it's, it's the principles. You don't have, very few countries, very few institutions have the luxury of being Nazar Brief University. You have KAUST in Saudi Arabia. I gave the example in Hong Kong, but indeed, these are expensive propositions. But you could have more modest targets and decide, I'm gonna become, I'm gonna move from good to great or from great to excellence in one area that makes sense in my context. Um, to take an example from Australia, James Cook University, if I'm not mistaken, has tried to shift its program to fit into the tropical environment into which, so you, you, you say, I'm not gonna be the best medical faculty in the world, but I'm gonna be the best for tropical medicine. And nothing attracts success more than success. You know, if you, if you create a, vis a virtual circle, then you, know, you will be able to attract more top academics, researchers, students, and then you'll move in a second and a third related areas, and that's how you go. You know, it, it takes time. Um, MIT, 80 years ago, was a small, unknown technical institute. It took time to build up to where they are today. Thank you. Andrew. Jump in and also, <laughs> also introduce yourself. So, Andrew Wachtel, uh, rector of Narcos University. Um, so, I would say, as, as a university trying to live in Kazakhstan, <laughs> yeah, if it works, that's great. Um, I don't need your money, I don't need your MOOCs, I don't need your faculty. I need you to, and I said this to you yesterday, and I'll say it again publicly. I need you to walk with me to the Ministry of Education, and I need you to tell the minister to get off my back. That's the only thing I need. If you, if that's if the one thing that you have proved. Правильно. Все правильно, ребята. That's the only thing we need from you. 
all the universities in Kazakhstan could benefit from exactly one thing. You go with us, you walk into the minister's office with me and with a few other people and you say, stop telling universities what to do. Because as long as they tell us what to do, we can't do the things that you're suggesting. And we can't do the things you're suggesting because they tell us exactly how we have to do it. And they think that our job is to repeat your model, which is ridiculous. We don't have the resources. We don't have the possibilities. Just get them off our backs. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Andy. Um, when I said earlier that part of our job and responsibility always has been from day one to also share our privileges with the other universities, academic freedom and autonomy has been one of the key things that we've been actually debating with the ministry. Unfortunately, there's not much continuity often at the most senior levels. So obviously, it doesn't excuse us. We have to continue to do this dialogue. Sometimes we're a little bit more successful. Sometimes we're less. Right now, I would say we're in a less successful phase. Um, but you know, it's just a phase. It's not, a, it's not a permanent situation. So yes, let's walk together. Okay. Thank you. Um, any of the next ones that? Uh, I would, I would try to take a stab at the, six, uh, the one that has garnered six votes on funding being dependent on tuition. In that case, should the focus be on teaching? Okay. So, what are your thoughts on, on this comment? Laura? Yeah, look, that's, that's a very, it's a very good question. Um, and I think that certainly, as I mentioned, um, a large bulk of our funding comes from teaching. But one of the things that you need to recognize is that our reputation is largely built on our research. And that's really because the research is very public. Um, we publish in international journals, people read them, they cite them, um, they're aware of, of our outputs. Whereas with teaching, it's, it's very much, um, it's, it's not as big a profile building activity, but it's, it's equally important, but it's not out there for everybody to see and everybody to rank. And I think if you have a look at most of the, the ranking systems which look at teaching excellence and research excellence, um, they're actually highly correlated and um, what basically people do is they say, oh, well, I know they're research excellent, so they must be e excellent at teaching, which actually doesn't follow. Um, so I think, um, no, I, I don't think the focus should be on teaching. I think we should have balanced focus on both teaching and learning and research because our research really does drive our reputation, which then attracts the top quality candidates, students to come in. Um, which then means that we also have to be good at teaching. So it's a virtuous circle, as I see it, where you need to have both aspects. However, having said that, you might, you know, in the interests of diversity and diversification, you're going to have a range of universities from very research intensive to very teaching intensive to somewhere in the middle. And I think that there is a place for all of them. Thank you. Let's move on with the next question. Or comment. Now let's go move to the one that garnered 13 votes on uh, universities, maybe even fostering, and maybe elite universities in particular, fostering inequality. The top right. Okay. And technology being the Leveler. There is this big tension between excellence and equity. Mm -hmm. If you are very selective, are you keeping people potential out? And there are ways around it. Many of the top universities in the world have what is called needs-blind admission. That if you are academically qualified, you will not be 
kept away because you don't have the money. That's one way of doing it. You have also affirmative action, which is very controversial, but I have examples from Brazil where the second top university in Campinas started an affirmative action program 10 years ago. So they lowered the bar for people from indigenous background, African Brazilian people, and they found out that what was very important is that once you admit them, you don't let them swim, but you accompany them with academic and financial support as needed. And then their results are as good as anybody else. And I think the, the, the American uh, Arizona State University is another great example of a university that in the past 15 years has transformed itself, trying to become a research university without necessarily being less, uh, more selective. And I, I want to finish, if I can have one minute, by an example about motivation, which comes from India, which, as you know, is a very hierarchical society with the caste and, and prejudice. And there is an experiment that was run a few years back that is fascinating. So it was a primary school level a test administered to a group of kids from the lowest caste, the untouchable, and the Brahmin caste. And the professor, the, the teacher, welcomed them in the following manner. She said, good morning, you beautiful children. Sit down and take this easy test. And both groups scored the same, which is what you would expect. But then they run the exper same experiment with just small <coughs> difference. When the kids entered the classroom, they told them, the, the teacher said, good morning, you beautiful children from the Bra Brahman uh, <laughs> caste. Please sit down in the front. You, the children from the untouchable, you sit in the back. That was the only difference. The test was the same. And the scores were dramatically different because the kids had been reminded where they belonged and so, in terms of self-esteem, the results were catastrophic. And so that's why motivation is very important. There are key examples of selective elite schools that admit uh, students from lower economic background, and they don't fit. They don't feel at ease because the culture of the rich kids is not a very positive, inclusive culture. Thank you, Jamil. I was sort of scanning the audience and I saw a lot of people nodding their heads when this example was raised off, you know, the, the implicit biases that we all develop in society. Yeah, I mean, I, it's, a, it's a very good question. Um, and, Speak and into the microphone, maybe. <laughs> okay. Yeah, thank you. It's a good, it's a good question, and I, and I think, um, I, I don't think it's, it's, it's a particularly widespread problem in, in, in my view, at least looking, looking globally, because u universities and higher education in general tend to be uh, engines of social, social mobility. I think what is somewhat concerning is, is what's happening in, um, in parts of the US with, with some of the top Ivy League universities that are reserving more and more places for what they call legacy uh, candidates. So people who's, who are either the children of alumni or the children of major donors. Um, and the reason that's concerning is, and why technology is, is, is not necessarily the solution, is because universities are more than just places where you go to learn things. I mean, they're, they're primarily pl places where you, you become socialized, you build Network. your networks. Mm -hmm. and, and we know that if you go to the right university in almost any country, it, you know, it can have a transformative effect on your, on your prospects and your social mobility. Um, and so for me, and, and for a university like Nazarbayev, what's, what's instructive about, this is a negative example in my view, is that if, if the university wants to be truly meritocratic, then it needs to move in, in, or stay in the direction that Jamil was talking about, which is you know, needs blind, 
um, and, and legacy blind, not caring where, not giving preference to the children of alumni or the, the children of, of major donors. I don't know how realistic or feasible that would be, but, I, but that's, the, that's the slippery slope. We intend to stay the course. Thank you. <laughs> Good. <laughs> um, at this point, let me ask a question, uh, the audience. So we heard from Andrew that maybe the biggest constraint here for the higher education system is the governance issue. Interference by the ministry or government trying to micromanage universities and so on. Is, do you all agree on this point? I thought that you did, but raise your hands just so that we have. Okay. Now, let me see who thinks that actually it's a matter of not having enough money or funding resources. Those of you who think that that's the biggest constraint. Well, nobody thinks that money is a constraint, so it actually you guys are... <laughs> The biggest constraint. Is it the middling constraint? <laughs> OK. And those of you who think that collecting talent, competing for talent, is the most difficult thing for you, who thinks, who, who, who is on that side? A few in the back. Maybe let me hear from you very much in the back, those who raised their hand. Can you explain a little bit what your constraints are in terms of competing for talent? Was <coughs> this? Uh мне кажется, есть некое, конечно, вот говорим все хорошо, модель нашего Назарбаева университета. И с другой стороны, вот в самом начале вот наши выступающие коллеги, они сказали, что вот вообще во всем мире поддерживается массовизация образования, как высшего образования. И здесь мы приходим к противоречию. Правильно? Ну, у нас... Например, в модели Назарбаев университет такого уже нет уже массовизации. А это, наверное, какие-то социальные проблемы наталкивают на это. Например, в европейских вузах там очень много беженцев и так далее. Безработица. Вот это все порождает значит, массовизацию образования в некоторых странах. Да? И здесь, конечно, финансы играют большую роль. Иначе как их удержать? Они же будут на улице, правильно ведь? А наша модель, вот, которую мы ориентируемся, Назарбаев университета, здесь, да, талантливые дети поступают, я сказал бы, да, вот, отборные такие, из Назарбаев интеллектуальных школ. То есть здесь разные, о разных моделях мы говорим. И в одной же дискуссии, поэтому некоторые моменты приводят к противоречию, мне кажется. Ну, это мое мнение. Thank you. So this gentleman expressed your opinion that as a university, its model is interesting, it's good, but it's sort of so much outside of the mainstream. <laughs> and for them, the pressing issues are how to um, mobilize funding, uh, ensure sufficient resources in an environment where you have basically economic, major economic issues, including, um, you know, uh, unemployment issues and so on. So as a university is good because also it has a as a sort of a feeder system of the intellectual schools. It's very interesting, good model, but some of their key issues are outside of that. But um, in the back... There. Hmm? There's a question just there. Just here? <laughs> ah, okay. Yes, but I get back to your idea, but in the back there was somebody who was wanting to comment, or I asked to comment on the question of competing for talent. Way back. Nobody's 
zoning up to it. <laughs> <laughs> Nobody wants to talk anymore? <laughs> you thought to. OK, maybe, maybe, ah, Wali Khan has, has identified, oh, has disappeared to reappear from the other side. Okay, I think if the person doesn't want to make a comment about attracting the best talent, I guess I can uh, comment on that and I can continue on the point that was made by the previous speaker. So, um, you know, if you put this problem in the context of Kazakhstan, Nazarbayev University, which, is, uh, uh, which has ample resources, which has uh, wonderful partners, attracts the best talent in Kazakhstan. Not only students, but also Bolashak students, also anybody who graduated from the West uh, with a Western degree. Everybody strives to come here to work either as a faculty member or as an administrator. Plus, we get the best students and I hope so, the best, some of the best faculty from around the world. And uh, in, in that context, it's uh, what happens in Kazakhstan that contributes to inequality within the country. Um, but then if you put the problem at the global scale, uh, we are aware of the fact that many of our graduates go further on and study in the best universities in the world. And then they, um, my fear is that they will remain in other countries. So as the, glo as the world, as the economy becomes more disruptive, and universities become more oriented towards this disruptive, disruptive economy needs, I think what happens at the global scale is that no matter how much the emerging economies are striving to build this uh, disruptive universities and to transform the economies of their countries, in fact, what happens that they are sort of feeding the brain drain of the best talent to the top countries in the world. And so, and one of the main challenges that Nazarbayev University has uh, like trying to address this problem is that how to um, how to balance the global like uh, remaining globally competitive and remaining disruptive but at the same time remaining oriented towards the local needs and then what I'm wondering at is what is other countries experiences with that um, is, like especially you Jam Jamil has so much experience uh, with other countries so how do other emerging economies grapple with this with the conflict between global and local and uh, you know, r resolving this problem as we are trying to build disruptive universities, servicing disruptive economies. Thank you. Could you also give your name so that My Jamil name is Aliyah Kozhebekova. I'm an assistant professor at the Graduate School of Education at NU. Jamil. So it's a variation of the question that I earlier raised. You know, how can middle-income countries actually develop world-class universities without fearing that the product, the outcome, will be brain drained? I would lie to you if I said that there is an easy answer to this question. First, it depends on the culture. There are countries that send many young people for masters or PhD overseas, and they come back uh, for some reasons. Like Indonesians, they, want, they prefer to go back home. In some African countries, more than others. I think it is equally a push and a pull factor. I'm myself a product of the brain drain. I left Morocco and I went to the World Bank where I worked for 25 years. I used to be a university professor. When I reflect on what I was missing there, I had academic freedom. I had a decent salary, nothing great, but it was OK. But I didn't feel that I have intellectual stimulation. So if you're a researcher in one field, you, you need to be able to work with other colleagues. That's part of, of it. So I think that it's not so much the money. It's the, the work environment that you offer. And you could, and I know, for example, Nazarbayev University has, has done it. You know, in the US or Canada or in Australia, I'm sure UK, professors spend most of their time looking for money, writing proposals. And you write 10 proposals, and if you're lucky, you get one finance. This is, if you find a place where you don't have to 
beg for money. You get money, and then you have the opportunity. And if you produce, you will be, you will get more money. Then that's a good way to attract. Also, brain drain. You know, we talk more about brain circulation. I'm working right now with a small young university in Namibia, in Southern Africa, university, Namibian University of Science and Technology. And it started as a polytechnic, and 20 years ago, they brought back a Namibian who had been working in the US for more than 15 years. And they gave him the opportunity to lead that institution. And he transformed it gradually from a polytechnic to a university of science and technology. And they are nowhere in the league of the great universities of the world. But they are getting there progressively. And I think that in, you know, in linking that to the ability to attract good students. Uh, it's true, in, in Zarbayev University today attracts, if not all, many of the top students <coughs> in your country. And we could say it's unfair, but again, you could change something in other universities that would make you attractive. And I finish with just one concrete example. In Mexico, one of the top universities called the Tech of Monterey, you may have heard about it. They jokingly say, we are the MIT of Mexico, and in 10 years, MIT will say, we are the Tech of the US. <laughs> and next to this Tech, which is very prestigious, very selective, there I, met, I visited a small private university called University of Monterey. It's a medium level university and I was surprised because they also offer, they have a school of engineering. And I asked them how being next to the tech of Monterey, who in his or her right mind will come to you instead of going to Monterey if they have the qualifications. So you're gonna get only bad students. I said, you will be surprised. What we do, which Monterey doesn't do, the tech, we do what is called service learning. It's one form of doing experiential learning. Integrated into our curriculum, the students with their professors work with local communities, poor communities, to solve some of their problems as part of the learning process. And the kids find this experience so enriching that it's become a good selling point for this small university. So uh, again, the same principles. What is your niche? What do you do in a unique way, like Waterloo University in Ontario that developed this co-op program that is, makes them different from others? You have to find not, and the problem with the rankings, and there is a ranking question, you know, we are so obsessed with climbing in the ranking, and when I work with university, I tell them, forget about the ranking. If you do something great, you will climb in the relevant ranking, and if you don't climb, it means that ranking does, is not meaningful. Thank you. No, just just very, very, very quickly to, to build on, on, on what Jamil was saying. I mean, the, the answer to, you know, to, to, the, to the challenge is, is not to say, well, you know, because it, there's a brain drain, I'm not going to build a, a, a top university in, in, my, in my country. It, it, that can't be the, uh, the answer. So therefore, the question is, if, if a brain drain and again, I, I like brain circulation better, is, is the inevitable consequence of, of having a, a world-class institution, then how do I leverage that? Uh, and the way to leverage it is to see your diaspora as, as an asset. And so, something I learned from, from Jamil a few years ago that has to do with my, my home country, uh, Cyprus. You showed a chart. Uh, I don't know if it's still the case now, but four years ago, the University of Cyprus is the number one recipient on a per capita basis of research grants from the European Union, competitive research grants. Why? Because of all the top Cypriot academics in universities across Europe that either have joint appointments or are collaborating on proposals with younger faculty members at the University of Cyprus. It, you know, they're an asset. It's not a zero-sum game. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Laura? 
Yeah, I think um, this is another reason that I'm such an advocate of diversification because I think that to follow up on, on Jamil's points, we shouldn't all be trying to be the same thing. And you know, when you look at the Australian context, we have five major population centres and then a lot of space in between. Um, and the big research intensive universities are located in those. However, you know, a lot of our regional universities have developed really unique programs that link with their local community. So um, Jamil gave the example of James Cook University in, in the tropical area. So they work on the coral reef and coral bleaching and environmental stuff and um, tropical diseases, et cetera, et cetera. So they're very much focused locally and they've embedded that um, sort of community engagement in what they're doing. And I can tell you, students actually um, really do value that, um, that local community engagement. And the other thing that some of our regional universities do really well is interact with our indigenous populations and they have much higher proportions of indigenous students than the city campuses do. So, so I think, you know, working out um, really what your values are and how they link with the local community is absolutely essential to, to drawing in people into, into your institution and really forming a community and it's a lifelong community. Um, let me add my five cents because it is a question that we are dealing with all the time um, and in my also discussions with the authorities. I mean, Kazakhstan 2050, president has challenged the nation to join the top 30. Okay, it's a big vision, very ambitious. We don't know whether it will become true or not. But it's a vision out there and, you know, excoricating everybody to move forward, I think, put it in that way. I think it would be very defeatist to think now that Kazakhstan forever like many, uh, maybe other middle income countries would forever be condemned to be where it is currently. It's a very static vision. When you look at our students, and I'm sure at the students of all the other universities here, uh, be it Eurasian, be it Al Farabi and others, KeyMap and so, none of them will probably think that, oh, today's Kazakhstan is where we want to be. I think uh, I see in our students, we have some representatives here, young people, who are very ambitious, who are very smart, they're very talented, we know that they can compete internationally, and they want to compete internationally. So it's good that they actually go out. But they're also very patriot, at least that's what they tell me. And they all tell me we want to contribute to the development of Kazakhstan. And I think that's a real asset. And I think we should work on it. And education is only one facet of moving forward. Together with education, you have obviously all the other parts of better government administration, public services, the business and investment climate you know, improvement, um, better infrastructure, better amenities, you know, the ability to attract international firms, international investors in all dimensions, no, not just in oil and gas. It is higher education or the education sector overall and research is part and parcel of an overall package to move forward in terms of development. So it's very difficult just to isolate one part. Now having said that, I think what Stavros also mentioned in terms of valuing diaspora is going to be extremely important. Now, why has China developed so rapidly over the last 40 years? In no small part because it was able to draw on the massive diaspora that exists globally, but also in particular, they were able to draw on the talent, the resources of Hong Kong, Taiwan, Southeast Asia. Um, unfortunately, Kazakhstan, although it's a big country, doesn't have too many people and a small diaspora at this point. But we know that, for instance, in the, in the Bay Area in California alone, there are about 1,000 or so Kazakhstani citizens who are working either in high tech or studying in the top universities there, so between Palo Alto all the way to Berkeley. There's no reason why we should not ta reach out to them and tap them and work with them. And that is one of the next initiatives that we're working on is to actually set up a little satellite office there 
see how it works, getting them to work with us, collaborate with us, but also exposing our students then to the entrepreneurial atmosphere in, obviously, in, in uh, California and so on. If that works well, we will try to do it elsewhere in some other places. Because, as also was mentioned, in this world we need to be present. We need to develop a global network. And we want to do it by going first where our diaspora actually is. Okay? So that's my answer to you. We have we are sort of running out of time, but we have one last comment coming from you guys. Uh, I think Alia wanted to say something. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity to speak. Uh, I'll try to be short. Uh, first of all, Dr. Laura, thank you very much for your answer. Uh, I, uh, actually, your idea of uh, um, that people matter is really echoes uh, in my heart and mind. Um, I would like to uh, raise a, um, back the question on the uh, transferability of a new model to uh, some of our Kazakhstani uh, institutions. And I would agree with the first comment that was made on that point that it's not only money, uh, but people that matter. Of course, we need niche creation, because it's good to have different universities that focus not only standard things, uh, but probably one university will be um, creating entrepreneurial people, another will be creating um, service to the society, third one will be more in the research, uh, applied research that will be uh, answering to the needs of a country, and etc. But I think that it's a group of people with vision, empowered professionals, and dedicated to move the change and be the agents in change with adequate resources, of course, uh, will be able to move this fo process forward. Thank you. Thank you. Any comment on this? No, I think um, I, I very much agree with what you're saying. And I think if, um, you know, if there's a, a last message, it's really value your people. And it's not just about attracting people. It is about retaining our good people and, and making sure that we develop them to cope with the changes into the future. Thank you. Um, and with this, we come to the end of our first session. You've been a marvelous audience. Thank you for your participation. And of course, thank you to our panelists. And I hope you learned. Tell the timetable. Lunch now.